Okay, so um, welcome everyone. We're gonna get going. We sure appreciate you taking time out of your um, evening to join us. Um, and um, as many of you know, this uh, conversation this evening is about summer planning. Um, just to give um, all of y'all a, a hearty welcome from Lisa and I. Um, we're just so excited to be with you this evening. Uh, we know that for many of you, your days are filled with uh, Zoom meetings or webinars. So it's an extra big commitment to carve out a little bit of time this evening to talk a little bit about this important topic. We also do want to um, uh, just state that we're super aware, Lisa and I meet with students and parents every day, uh, just how stressful this time of the year is given the uncertainty. So we just want to thank you and, and make sure we're aware of uh, what your homes are like and what your lives are like and families are like right now. And as always, we just want to give our thoughts to all of you who have family members who are struggling or have struggled with this um, disease and also folks who are first responders, folks who are um, involved in providing care for those. So again, welcome. Uh, I think most everybody on this knows College Match Point. Um, Lisa Bain Carlton started College Match Point 11 years ago, and we've worked with high school students ever since then. Our focus has always been around helping students engage with their interests, their aptitudes, and their motivators. We think this is foundational to what it means to have a successful high school life and what it means to launch into college and ultimately into their first career. So um, while some of this this evening will have specific implications for college planning and college applications, we want to be really clear that philosophically we believe that these are choices that a student makes that can impact her life day to day. And these are decisions that a student can make that it helps him be more engaged when, with his aptitudes, his interests, and his motivators. So with that as context, um, I, I thought I'd just give a nod to why all of us would be re-engaging on summer planning on April 28th, not exactly when high school students um, planned to be doing summer planning and certainly not historically when our team works with students around summer planning. Uh, COVID-19 hasn't just randomized students and parents schedules for the spring, it's begun to have an impact for the summer. Um, some summer programs have already announced a shift online for the entire summer. Um, some are announcing that they hope to initially have online but shift to some kind of in-person setting. And then some um, programs are waiting to announce plans in the next few weeks. A couple of very specific examples. Um, the University of Texas Discovery Camps have announced they won't have in-person sessions, but they're shifting to online. Two of the biggest camps here in Central Texas, Camp Longhorn and Laity Lodge, have announced that they'll let parents and students know in the next couple of weeks. So it sort of created that zigzag on this road sign and it sort of created a lot of questions. So one comment before I turn it over to Lisa, most of us are aware of Zoom and its wonderful functionality. We'd encourage you to embrace the Q&A aspect of Zoom. We wanna make sure that we're answering your questions and we wanna make sure as best as we can, this is a discussion, even though it's a webinar. So as we go through, we'll try to tackle questions in the different sections that we're on. And then if we haven't going to be able to cover them and we have time at the end, we'll definitely try to um, cover all the questions that we have in the end. As always, an archived video version of this will be available afterwards. But now I wanna turn it over a little bit to Lisa. Hey everybody, and as Bob said, welcome. We really appreciate you taking your time out to share an hour talking about um, summer planning. As Bob said, as a mom, I know that summer planning normally happens in January, so this is throwing us all off for sure. And But before we kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what programs might be available, how we might make a plan B, if our student was thinking they were going to be a camp counselor or go to a summer program, I want to just take a step back for a minute and say, 
why do we do all these activities anyway? And I'm gonna propose as a person who helps kids with college, that college isn't the number one reason to do this. Um, students who are engaged, who try things out, who participate, who are active, are more successful in high school and they're more hopeful for the future. And I know that meeting with students often right now, students are a little worried about the future. So being engaged and helping them see things outside of the world and exploring things that they might be interested in, skills, is really important to developing them as a person. And activity isn't necessarily just about college but it is about learning some things that are very useful for college and very useful for life after college. Learning what one is good at, learning where, where somebody has skills or aptitudes. Also, learning how to reflect about that. Gosh, when I did this activity, I realized I thought I was gonna love this, but when I started it, I wasn't sure because I didn't know anybody, and, and on and on and on. One of the things that we know helping kids with the college process is one of the most critical elements, and this isn't just for college, but this is also as they apply for jobs, is the ability to reflect upon one's experience. It's very difficult to develop that muscle if a student doesn't have opportunities, if they stand on the sidelines and actually don't engage. Now, this doesn't mean that they have to be the student council president or in 18 clubs at school. It's got to actually fit the student. And I think as we think philosophically, I want to put that frame on it, that engagement has to fit the student. So that's really, really important. So that just gives you kind of a little background that as we work with students, we don't spend a lot of time talking about college, especially in the ninth and 10th grade, except maybe in, in one place, which Bob will talk about. Um, we're really trying to get the kids to try things on and explore. So the first thing, how can you as a parent help? All this, your student had plans to go to camp. They had a summer job. They had an internship, whatever it was. Now you're possibly, at a minimum, you need a good plan B, I would say. First thing is, what are areas that have engaged them in the past? What do they love? What do they enjoy? What do you notice really lights them up when they talk about it? Or what have they ever been curious about that whenever they're exposed to it, they're like, oh, that's really cool. Maybe it's cultures, maybe it's art, maybe it's sports, maybe it's broadcasting, maybe it's computers. And of those things that they, areas of engagement, which ones are they actually interested in learning more about? One of the things that students in the younger grades actually say a lot is, well, gosh, you know, engineering sounds interesting. What do you know about engineering? Well, not a lot. So they want to something that sounds good that they may have, you know, good math skills, good science skills, spatial visualization. And so they think, oh, I might be good at this, but they want to explore it. There's not a lot of risk here. They're in the younger years and they can explore. The other area that you might help them look at is, what are things they'd like to enhance? Maybe they already are pretty far down a path in an interest area. Some of our kids, kids vary a lot in the ninth and 10th grade where they're gonna fall here. Some of them are gonna have kind of sat on the sidelines. Don't worry, many of them are still gonna jump in and some are far down the road. So let's say they already have an area of interest how would they like to take that interest further? So how could they engage? How can they explore? Or how can they enhance areas that they're already interested in? I think those are some sort of beginning questions we want to ask as students start down this road of how they may rethink the summer. One of the questions that's already come in, Lisa, is how does this model of engage, explore, enhance impact 11th graders, students who can see the college application window in front of them. I like to make a comment and then Lisa, please jump in. And that is that, that colleges nowadays, we've had a couple of other webinars where we've talked about the importance of a major choice of what's called fit to major in a resume. But colleges also wanna see students who exhibit what they call intellectual curiosity students who dive deep into a topic. I met with a student yesterday who's teaching himself Eudor. Um, and, and he's doing that not because he wants to major in it or even because he wants a career in it. 
He's doing it because he's always been engaged in languages and he wants to explore his family's culture by learning that. And so for parents on this who are parents of 11th graders or rising seniors, I'd encourage you not just to, to help your student approach this as some kind of resume recipe. What is it gonna take for my student to have a good shot at school A, B, or C? but instead to help your current junior really think about where have they been engaged in the past? What do they want to explore? What are their possible new areas that really might engage their intellectual curiosity? And then where are their skills that they want to enhance? Lisa, any other comments in terms of how parents can help support rising seniors, students who are juniors at this point? Well, I would say if the student does have an area where they uh, want to major, that they know they want to major in business or engineering or computer science, if they're really light on experience in those areas, then if they want to learn the language, they may want to do a little bit along that too, depending on their college list. And I think it'll be more clear in the next slide when Bob kind of talks about um, you know, the different ages and how this progresses. I think we're gonna answer that question. Great, okay, and again, I'd like to remind folks, as we get deeper into this, if you have specific questions, feel free to just pop open that Q&A box and share your questions, and Lisa and I will try to tackle them as we go. So um, when um, many of you registered, you specifically said, I have a 10th grader and she had plans for this this summer. I have an 11th grader and they're devastated because they had hoped to do this, this, and this summer. What should I do? And specifically, what's important for my student in their grade? So um, Lisa and I talked about this and based on our work with students, we really want you to think of them as sort of three distinct life stages. For ninth graders, it's a great opportunity in the summer for them to explore getting more involved in a number of different areas of interest. We do not think it's healthy for a student to only track, I'm either computer science or bust. We really encourage students to take advantage of their early years in high school and to be involved in a number of different interest areas. And in a couple of minutes when we share with you suggestions of types of programs, will point out opportunities where they might be able to try on being involved. Now, this summer may, be, may provide some very specific challenges, but also opportunities for a student to grow broad. So for a ninth grader, the key term that we'd focus you on is involved. Now for a 10th grader, oftentimes when we work with 10th graders, they have a hypothesis. They have an understanding over their 10th year, 10th uh, grade, that they developed a set of knowledge that they really felt engaged in physics, or they really loved their work in musical theater. And they have a hypothesis of potentially where their major or college list may go, or even more important, what their hypothesis are. I met with a student last week who's trying to decide between two very disparate majors. And what they were saying is, I know I'm good at both, I wanna try them on this summer. I wanna test them out. I don't wanna yet commit to one or the other. And I think I wanna see this summer if I can sort of compare and contrast two areas of involvement. And then finally for 11th graders, two watchwords that we hear again and again, and we saw so much with this year's admissions results, is that 11th graders really want to focus on what we call initiative and impact. That a student becomes more self-driven, that they take that extra step, and that one of the things they're focusing on is how do they leave a lasting impact, a legacy, in the communities that they're involved in. And I can think of no more and more important time in our lifetime than for some of these 11th graders to really look at the impact they can have on their local communities and in some cases on a more regional or global community. So from our standpoint, while the undergirding philosophy of activities spans across all years of high school, there might be some areas to particularly focus on if you have a ninth grader, a 10th grader, or an 11th grader. 
Lisa, one question that's come up in the Q&A is, what if a student is in 10th grade and they have no hypotheses? Great question. Well, I would say that somehow you're going to have to look at what are, we believe that following your aptitudes, those things that you're actually born good at, that you actually have kind of innate skill in, and then bring your passions along the side. So what is the student naturally good at would be kind of where I would start. Um, I think that's a very good place to start. And so, and it may be that if the student really doesn't have a hypothesis, they may be more in the category of needing to try a number of things. So this, while this is laid out, I can tell you 11th graders who are at the ninth grade spot, and I can tell you ninth graders that are at the 11th grade spot. So we're giving you a super broad framework. I wouldn't get worried about that. You've got to start where the student is. And so I would say for a student who doesn't have, which is not atypical, there's definitely a group of students like that who, who really don't, and that's, that's totally age appropriate. But what I would encourage is to pick two or three things to try and, and start there, because you've got to start where the student actually is. So we can't, if you, you know, we've had students walk in the door spring of 11th grade and not have really a lot you know, figured out and have, have worked with them to help them get something. So while this is a nice framework for us to make out, every student's going to fit in a little bit different places here. So um, I would say kind of maybe try a few things out. And I mean, a little bit depends on some students have a little resistance to wanting to engage, which is normally in our experience that they they feel badly that they don't know. So it gets to be this circle. And then I think we as adults sometimes are like, what is it? What is it? What do you want to do? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know. And you get in this push pull. It's like, okay, let's take the pressure off a little bit. What's a couple of things that sound good? Let's look through this. Which of these might be somewhat interesting to you? So I think you kind of have to take it that way. The other comment I was going to make to just piggyback on what Bob said, I do think that one of the things that is important in this moment and has become more important overall in um, college admissions, jobs, it is character. So, so I do think doing some things, trying to expose your students to some things that develop character are also really important, especially if you don't have some of those baked into your life already. Lisa, one other question before we get off this slide is, one of the parents noted that they have an 11th grader who has a number of highly selective colleges on their wish list. <laughs> um, and so they're wondering, what can you point to in the most recent college admissions results that indicates why initiative and impact are so important for that student and the parent to consider? Great question. Thank you. Um, I, you know, as I always go back and study students after, after an admission cycle. And students who can organically grow things, whether it's a community service project, an independent study project, um, you know, taking something that is at their school and growing it. Anything where the student had to organically kind of figure it out wins every time. And I would say, that the kind of, you know, here I'll just fit into this spot for highly selective schools, it, it, they, they, don't, they don't read as well. Now that's not to say that, that, I mean, I can certainly point to students who did well, but when I go back and this year, you know, we had a number of surprises where I was like, wow, that's awesome. I didn't know if I saw that coming. And um, almost all of those kids, had developed, you know, their own initiative to take some things on. Now, in differing levels of impact, some of them might have been local, some of them might have been doing something really bold that just impacted themselves, you know. So, um, but I think the, that that ability to say, I'm interested in this, I'm going to take the work and the steps to get there, tells a college a lot about 
what a student's gonna be like on their campus. And in my mind, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. That's the cherry on the top when you can get that. And so for students who are interested in highly selective schools, that, that needs to be considered as a part of their portfolio. I wanna make one other comment before we leave this slide, and that is, as you might imagine, Lisa and I have spent countless hours on evening webinars with admissions directors across the country. And all of, many of them have noted that resume and activities are very likely to become even more important in this class's holistic read. And one of the things they said over and over again is they'd encourage students to start with where they are, with what their story has developed in ninth and 10th grade, rather than magically zigzagging and in the summer between their junior and senior year, attempting to remake themselves as one thing or another. They, they oftentimes say, Georgetown did this fabulous analysis several years ago, where they said, honestly, admissions directors can tell when a resume is being gained. And instead, they really are interested in the student's story and in their progression. Okay, okay we've got a couple other questions here. Um, one is, my summer internship I planned was integral to my resume, and I believe it would be one of the more impressive aspects. Should it not happen, I'm not sure anything could replace how impressive it was. I feel like this may hurt me in admissions when being compared against kids who did the most impressive things prior to the virus. First, I just want to say I'm sorry because obviously the student has done a lot of work to get something that, that was really great. And I think a couple of things. One is I think there is going to be an opportunity on the application to tell what you were going to do prior to the virus. And I think that if the student is impressive enough that they got that, I 100% believe they've got another good thing in them. So I think part of it is allowing oneself to be disappointed that they probably put a lot of work into getting that. But who that student is, there's definitely something else out there that they can do that will, it may not show the same thing, but it's going to show a different thing. And, and it's probably a good story too in that that might come out in essays. Um, another person asked, where is initiative and impact reflected in a college application? Great question. And I would say that you're going to see that in the resume and you're probably going to see it in the essays because part of what you, what a student, what they want is also things that they can actually talk about. So I think that is um, super important. It's going to definitely come out in the resume, but is likely going to come out in the essays as well. Bob, um, one of the last question was, what does that mean, things that develop character? So I, I think um, character is a classic essay and interview question. Um, and, and, I, and I would speak to the student who um, is terribly disappointed that they had an internship lined up. The student who's gone to the same summer camp for seven years. And after that disappointment, the student stepped back and said, what did I learn at that summer camp? Why was I interested in that internship? And how do I not only show resilience, obviously a very popular buzzword for college admissions, but how do I go back to the things that motivate me, to my skills, and how are my values lived out in the way I reset my summer? Because as Lisa said, it's very likely that the story of that reset is part of the story. That it's perfectly great for a student to say, I thought I'd go this way, I ended up going this way, and that journey was all the better because of what I learned and because of the impact I had based on that choice. I actually struggled, and as a result, I actually stepped into driving this myself. And the other thing I would to add there, yeah, I would say in character is also the classic reaching out and caring about other people. I think that that in the last probably cycle or two of admissions, we have seen become more important again. I think colleges are looking at, can the student do the work here? Do they bring, what else do they bring to the table in terms of activity? But are they going to be a good roommate? Are they going to be polite in class? Are they going to be like, I think there's some basic kind of, um, caring for others kind of thing that has become a little more important in this process than it was a couple years ago. So, so I do think that piece in terms of character and how you're able to show that is, is pretty important. 
And, and a last comment here, I think many of you may have joined us for a session around designing your high school, um, utilizing some of the design thinking tools. And uh, one of the things that's crucial there is for high school students to get comfortable asking for help. Now, I know this may be particularly challenging for all of us having our kids at home doing online learning. Ask, them asking us to help with geometry or calculus may be help that we never imagined we'd be asked to give. But I think students have an opportunity, and it is a real challenge, to ask for help in resetting their plans. And that character development is crucial for students. Now, Lisa and I talked a bit about involvement, initiative, and impact. This is a model we've developed and utilized with students across the grades in high school, and honestly with some students in college. And it really starts, as Lisa said, with aptitude, skills, and motivations. We have some questions here that we typically utilize with students as we're helping them reflect on their interests, where they've been involved, what initiative they're showing, and ultimately what impact they're having. And, and um, one of the metaphors we've used here is a trail map. We think this I-4 model is your compass. It's your true north to make sure you're starting with your aptitude, skills, and motivation, but that you're considering, is this an opportunity for me to take initiative? And ultimately, what kind of impact I could have? And while we earlier sort of tried to align it to ninth, 10th, or 11th grade, it's so heartening to be talking to ninth graders right now who are choosing to take initiative and impact their neighborhood, a club they're a part of, a band they're a part of, even older family members, and really having an impact during this crisis. So with that as context, Lisa and I have identified what we think are the five major categories of opportunities for your students to consider a plan B, a possible reset for the summer. Uh, many of you may have um, reviewed our um, college match point guide to summer planning in a time of COVID-19. And what we'd like to do is give you A, a further definition of these five categories, and then B, some advice as parents. Now we've been really encouraged by the Q&A, so when we get to a section, don't hesitate to ask us specific questions. And one thing I would say is those categories that we, we had listed there are understanding that we're probably in a COVID world. So we, it's possible that a student could get a job or an internship. We really left those off because we are seeing that that's pretty challenging right now. And given, you know, people working from home and things like that. So if you have those possibilities, there certainly are possibilities, but we were trying to give you things that would give you resources that you might not know about. So just want to put that caveat in there that normally if we were talking about summer, we would have those things in there as well. Several weeks ago, Lisa and I and our team started to get emails from students who disappointingly told us that they had been accepted to to uh, summer pre-college programs and that the pre-college program had either said it had been canceled or in many cases shifted to online summer pre-college programs. Now, for those of you who have students who haven't considered one of these, these programs are hosted um, by a college or university. One note, the affiliation is not always direct. Some students often ask, if that's my early decision school, should I only do that one because it'll look better for me? In many cases, these programs aren't necessarily directly affiliated with the school, even though they may use faculty and be hosted by the school. The second thing to know about the pre-college programs is they are oftentimes shorter in duration, oftentimes one to three weeks. We've seen that with a couple of the schools that have switched to online pre-college programs and they are substantially more project-based. They oftentimes, um, in, a, in an in-person setting, are low on lecture and high on active. There are a cohort of other high school students who've articulated an interest in that topic, and a faculty member at a college or university is engaging them in a set of activities that closely approximate what it would be like to study that course at their campus. And so these online uh, pre-college programs can oftentimes be super helpful for students 
who were trying to try on and decide one major versus another. And they can also be very, very helpful for students who are more active learners. They're more hands-on learners. And while they may not be able to hold the project online, a pre-college program may give them the opportunity for a more active and engaged learning style. Lisa, anything to add on pre-college programs? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, just as Bob said, this gives you no leg up in getting in that college, so very important. I think we tend to be a fan of these programs more in the younger years, so more in the um, ninth and 10th grades, although this year I think it's going to vary a little bit because we don't have as many other options, right? Um, I, many of them are non-credit, and we'll talk about that now and then again when we talk about college classes. I'm a pretty big fan, at least at ninth and 10th grade, of sticking to non-credit things. I, I think that just gets things complicated. And while these are going to mimic college a little bit, they're going to be somewhere between college and kind of summer campy around a topic, okay? And so, and some of them are more intense than others for sure. And one way you can tell that is if it's credit or non-credit. I'd be careful with credit unless your student is academically quite, you know, you, you feel confident in their abilities. And so you'll see, this is just an example of the Tufts pre-college intensives, which have all switched to online. So they've got engineering, they've got leadership for social change, they've got international relations, mini med school, art, coding. So a real nice diversity of programs. Um, and oftentimes, like, we might see a student who's not sure if they want to be an engineer or a doctor is, is common. So, you know, th those are sometimes decisions that students have to make. Um, but this is just gives you a little example. And as Bob mentioned, we have both our guide that we put out and then we have got a live web page where we just keep adding stuff every day because new stuff's coming in every day and then things are filling up and we're taking them off. So we're trying to keep that as live as possible. But this just gives you one example of free college intensives. And I think one of the questions that we had here, Bob, was um, someone asked, um, can you give ex specific resources to explore options? And these kind of programs would be um, especially good options for a 10th grader, depending on their interests. Oh, it's really fun to see old clients on here. How fun. Hi. One, and, <laughs> one, fun. One, comment, one comment on that in terms of how to explore. Um, on, uh, on yesterday, on Monday, uh, I was working with a student who had, uh, really was interested in international relations. Um, she had done the research we met a couple of weeks ago and had really dived into the Tufts International Relations Pre-College Program and picked up the phone. The phone number is right there on the top of the page and called and asked Tufts, can I talk to someone about this? She spent 45 minutes on a Zoom with the faculty member who's doing the international relations intensive. She already started talking to them about the project she'll do. She was totally animated and that student went from sort of really disappointed from shelter in place to really hopeful about the future having engaged. So one of the things that Lisa always points out for high school students is it's great experience of learning just to pick up the phone and talk to someone at the college or university. Mom and dad can do it, Lisa and I can do it, but it doesn't come close to the opportunity for a student to really engage and see if this connects to their interests. There's another question on, is there still time to apply to pre-college programs? Yes. And the reason for that is, is a lot of people are deciding, no, I actually don't want to do an online program. My student has had all the online they can take and I, they don't want to do it. So what we're seeing, it's very, just like college, um, you know, decisions right now, it's very fluid. So I would say there is still, still time to apply. The, the, Bob, what would you say the rollover we've really seen in the last two weeks, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think the, the canary in the coal mine was brown about two and a half weeks ago. Um, and we've started to see these roll pretty quickly. Um, some students are being proactive and reaching out to programs they were already accepted in. And we're encouraging that just to make sure if they need to make a plan B. Right. And if you, so if you were, that's a great point, Bob. If you were already, if your student was already in a pre-college program, first step 
is to call because I've also had a few of my students who were in a program that uh, that turned on, went to um, online. The family got on the phone, talked to them to learn a little more about it because the student is younger and wanted something pretty interactive, and it's still going to be. And they just and it also was significantly less expensive, which never hurts. And so um, they're actually pretty excited about it. So I would say um, I wouldn't wait real long on this if this is what you thought you wanted to do. I think these are going to be popular. Now, um, one of the uh, things that we're discussing with students is the concept of taking an online college class. Now, I want to comment on the fact that oftentimes a student reacts to that by saying, you got to be kidding me. I've just spent six weeks in online high school classes. Now you're telling me I ought to consider an online college class this summer. Um, you know, one thing I would assure you is that these online classes are very different from the high school classes they've taken uh, this spring. First, they were developed as online classes by college instructors or subject matter experts, and they built them to be taken by students online. So they've looked at how to nurture engagement, they've looked at developing quality content and assignments, Oftentimes, these are instructors who've taught online for years. And so while a student may have a sort of knee-jerk reaction of, there's absolutely no way I take an online class this summer, we do encourage students to at least consider it. Now, we encourage families, um, both parents and students, to think about um, uh, three aspects in terms of evaluating the classes. First, the student's learning style. There are some online classes, not to be too geeky, that are called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Classes. They're self-paced and they depend on a lot of self-motivation for the student. That may not be the best fit for a student who sometimes struggles with motivation. The second issue is level of engagement. There are some classes and platforms we'll expose you to um, there's a coding platform called Code Academy that allows students almost from the first page to jump in and code. And so you really want to look at if your student is an active learner who depends on lots of social engagement, then some of these platforms are better suited. And then as Lisa said, you're going to want to consider credit. Lisa, one of the questions already is, should my student only take credit, college credit online classes? Oh, gosh, that... Um... Not necessarily. I, I think that depends on your student. If if they're in the eleventh grade and they're they're trying to do this as kind of you know a hit at home to show their academic muscle, then 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 maybe. If they're trying to explore an interest area and just learn for the sake of learning, maybe not. Um, I think that's very student dependent and has. I could, I could argue either side of that, that, that you could, I can see advantages to both. There is some charm in the learning for the sake of learning, and there is nothing wrong with getting a grade from a, you know, prestigious, and it kind of depends which of these platforms you, um, you choose. Um, there was a couple other questions. One person asked, is there a website, and we will, we're giving the website at the end, right, Bob, that has yeah. the, all yeah. the, the programs on it, right? And, um, Remember that you're you're not necessary even if you get credit it doesn't mean that that's necessarily going to be taken the college that you attend is going to take that credit. So I wouldn't start taking a bunch of college credit thinking you're going to get ahead or take your English or something like that. What we're talking about is growing your interest in your skills. Now some um some students might prefer to get credit and show that whether they ever use that credit or not. Um, and then there was one other question, Bob, that is a little related to college admissions, but we can go on and answer that, which was, do you think colleges will extend their application submission deadlines? And if so, will fall activities and grades be important to the process? Uh, gosh, um, I, I think the answer that Lisa and I would probably both give is um, colleges and universities are figuring that out right now. Um, and, and so they're oftentimes gauging it or couching it in terms of we're wondering if. I think Lisa and I both expect that there will be schools that ask students for some visibility into their fall grades. 
And there will be some schools that are fully aware that a student's independent project or a student's, indep or a student's activities may be more significant in the fall than they have historically. Um, Lisa, any comments to add on that? Um, I do think that things in the fall are probably more important this year. That's my guess. It's, it's not, it's not a, I can't guarantee that, but my guess is that what the students do, but we typically, most of our students, many of our students are doing independent projects in the fall through their schools. Many of them are maybe taking on some kind of leadership or they've already got some project going that they're continuing. You can already, and we've always done this, had on their resume, um, the things that they're planning on doing forward. Now you can't say you did it, but you can show it in the future. So, so that's, that's not too hard. I do think the fall grades probably do end up being more important is my guess. Um, Bob, there's another question of, is it important that they at least, at least get a certificate out of the program? Gosh, again, that really depends. Um, there are some programs that quote unquote market certificates as an upgrade and I'm always dubious about those. If there are specific skills that a student is looking to certify, they may want to consider that. An example I would give is that we have a student who um, is looking to build their technology background. They taught themselves a lot of languages, but now they want to step up to a new level of languages. And they've made a choice to get a certification and to show that certification on both their resume and their LinkedIn profile. Again, it's one of those unfortunate answers in college admissions. It really depends on the student and their college list. And I would say I've seen students like in architecture take a bunch of CAD classes and get a certificate, you know, some kind of certification. So, I mean, it can be, I wouldn't say it's always important, but it, I think it probably, like Bob said, it just depends on. So we, we talked about where they might find college classes and we mentioned our page where we're updating opportunities. I want to give you a two minute primer on online college classes and college classes your students might consider. So there are a number of colleges and universities that either have had historically or have beefed up this summer, summer college classes for high school students online. We're showing two examples here, Purdue and Georgetown. They have a course catalog, just like you would expect at their college with registration deadlines and a syllabus and they're fabulous. Um, there are also some platforms that colleges and universities have partnered on to host classes across multiple schools. The two most significant examples of them are Coursera, which came out of Stanford and now includes a whole host of colleges and universities. We're showing here a very popular class right now. Johns Hopkins, within two weeks of the quarantine, started hosting this class. I've been taking it and a number of students are taking it. There are 75,000 people globally that are taking this class. And it's a Johns Hopkins class that happens to be hosted on this Coursera platform. And then there's a similar platform, platform called edX. All the courses in edX and Coursera are college instructor led courses. And edX is a consortium that started with MIT and Harvard, and it now includes University of Texas at Austin and 17 other colleges and universities. So we always say to students, and in our resource page, we highlight a number of these, but we always say to students, try to do a good job at looking at these as a starting point. Coursera is just rolling out a matching system that will actually match classes on their platform to college classes at universities and colleges. They're trying to help that question that came up earlier about can a student get credit if they take this class on my platform. It's not complete yet, but these are two categories of college delivered classes, either directly from the school or hosted on a platform, in this case, Coursera and edX. And I'll say that I was just on with a student right before we jumped on this, and he is wants to be a history major. And so we went on edX and one of the and looked at there was a lot of history classes that he was interested in. One of the things that we talked about is there's self paced classes and there's paced classes. And so we talked about he wasn't really wanting to do a self-paced, but more a class that has a start date and a little more um, interaction. So that's, and the other thing I would mention 
because of cost is that you're going to find these platforms are much less expensive than taking classes through a college. So if, if budget wise, that that's a consideration, just one thing to think about. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. In addition to that, there are a number of other websites that pull together online classes. Some of those classes are hosted and developed by college or university professors. Some of them are by subject matter experts. One site is called Udacity, and we're noting here a psychology class that's taught by a professor at San Jose State University. Udemy is another platform. It tends to be a little more skills-based. All the courses in Udemy tend to be fee-based. They require some cost. And both platforms are platforms that will typically offer a certification, I would call, upgrade. Um, in addition to that, I mentioned earlier Code Academy. We have some families that have worked with Hello World here in Austin, and they're spectacular. I think they're in the process of considering how to go online this summer. Code Academy tends to be a more active environment for students. We have a student who's taking uh, HTML and how to build web pages. Within the first two days, they had built their own simple web page. So it was really motivating for a student who depends on hands-on and sort of results-based learning. And then we have seen a number of students who have reacted to this crisis by wanting to learn a little bit more internationally. And in this case, uh, LanguageBird is a great platform to learn languages, okay? There are a number of other systems we do encourage students to start with what we feel like are sort of trusted platforms rather than just going to Google and searching for, I want to take a public health class. So um, with that as sort of a primer on online classes. Wait, wait, you got one question here, Bob. Um, somebody wanted to know, how would you, what's the application process look like for these type of classes? So your oh gosh, classes. so if you go to the classes that are more traditionally um, connected to a college and university, there's an enrollment or a registration. So you um, register for the class, you're charged a fee. Oftentimes there's a class size limit if it's an active class. If it's more self-paced, there tends not to be um, a class size limit. And what I would say is the nice thing about Coursera and edX is they're really transparent about how to register. Um, Purdue and Georgetown both take a little more work to see how to register and sign up, but all four of these options you're quickly going to be able to see how can my students sign up if they're interested in that class. I would say- Now if you go to the, um, if you go to the online, if you go to the college, like the pre-college programs, which I know some of you are familiar with, that's where you often have to write a short essay. They're usually not very long, but they're just trying to want to see that the student is going to actually be engaged because those are, are really dependent on the group working well together. And then these types of sites, I would say they're oftentimes for-profit companies. And so you're looking at more of almost a purchase or an add to cart model. Um, that a student is creating a, plat a, a profile. Parents will obviously want to be involved in this, both for the cost, but also for the sharing of information. But um, these tend to be more like you're purchasing an online product. Um, we now want to turn our attention um, uh, to, and we really appreciate the questions, they're just so helpful, to this idea of independent projects. Many students are already engaged with a teacher at their school, or in some cases, even a college faculty member as a mentor. We are seeing some students who hadn't planned on independent projects actually responding to this increase in available time, both in the spring and summer, by reaching out for an opportunity to delve deeper into an academic area of interest. A great example here is a student who took a robotics class at her high school, but didn't have the opportunity to gain specific experience with drones and a coding language only used for drones. So they worked with their teacher and are this summer doing a drone project where they're developing a specific use drone and programming it. They would have never gotten that opportunity during a traditional class. And they've worked with that mentor to have a target output or goal 
and that that mentor is going to help them through the process. Lisa, we make a point here that this can be meaningful in an admissions read, particularly at selective colleges. Can you translate that for some parents? Sure. So I think we talked about this a little bit earlier. And I, I, I want to talk about two things. One is that this isn't just for kids who are STEM. There are many, you know, I had a, I've had students do multiple different independent, pro, independent projects, and some of them could be more like a community service project that they're kind of really growing with. And then some of them, like I had a young woman a few years back who did, um, who did a project where she worked with a business that um, was looking to make a social impact. So part of the proceeds went to nonprofits. She had an interest in, in potentially working in nonprofits. So, so the independent projects are really broad. I've had students compare different types of literature. I have a young man right now um, who's working on a really interesting history um, um, independent project that he just you know, thought up himself and is doing the research on. And um, so this can be, I think the best independent projects have a mentor. I, I'm impressed when I see young people who can do this without them. I have a few times seen parents be that mentor, so there's nothing wrong with that if you can, if you can provide that for your student or possibly you know someone. I think I spoke to this. It shows a lot of initiative and intellectual curiosity, which is a word Bob mentioned, two really critically important components of highly selective college admissions. So, um, so and I think independent projects teach a lot of skills that students are gonna carry with them in college and carry with them beyond college when they're in a job and you've got to you know, quickly think up an idea and that kind of thing. So I would say those kind of activities in the highly selective college admissions are, are definitely great possibilities. They're not the only possibility, I wanna say that too, but they are great possibilities. So we've got about 10 more minutes left with all of you. And so we want to cover two more types of activities and then end with some advice for the role you can play as a parent. Lisa touched on this earlier, career related activities, internships we've already heard from students may be more difficult. Companies are obviously really scrambling. And so the coordination and support for a high school student may be more difficult. We have seen families either reach out to close family friends and help their student identify something, or in some cases, actually look at family businesses that the student can be involved in in an internship this summer. We also have seen, on the other hand, a real increase in number of informational interviews that students are doing by Zoom with people who are in the career or major area that they're interested in. Now, we just wanna make a note it is nearly an impossible for a student to cold call and get an internship or informational interview. Both of these will really depend on parents taking a little bit of an active role just in the connecting of the student so that she can then engage with either the informational interview or ultimately the internship. And one thing that I want to say here, because I think that oftentimes um, families are are a little bit confused about. It is absolutely acceptable for your student to work in the family business. What I would say, and we've seen this be successful time and time again, give them a concrete project that they're going to do. Now, obviously you're not going to hand over the business to them, but is there a small piece that they could develop and grow in. And many of our families sometimes will have the student not work with the parent, but maybe someone else in the company. Other students have worked with the parent and it's worked out great. So um, I do really encourage um, you to consider that because I think for some reason, a lot of people think that that's sometimes a no-no. And it, it, that has been, students are developing skills. That's what we're looking at. Are they exploring their interests? Are they developing skills? Absolutely they are. Most of these things, as Bob said, is going to require some parent involvement for this to happen. But the great thing about these is that these kinds of things also do require initiative and don't cost any money, which, you know, is also important. So just a plug there. One other question a, a parent asked, is it really realistic for a summer to, for a student to do a summer long internship? And the answer is, Occasionally, but not often. 
the majority of these internships can be one, two, or three weeks. Oftentimes they can be 10 to 15, even 20 hours a week. We oftentimes think of these as sort of shadows on steroids or project-based support that a student can help a company with. So we, we, um, we always want to say to people, if, if a student has a grand idea for an internship or a parent thinks it's the entire summer, that could happen, but it's rarely the case. And most of those are going to be your competitive apply for in December, Bank of America, you know, the big intern, you know, those big internships. And I will say that our, our clients, we certainly have clients who do those, but I wouldn't worry that you don't have the big name thing. You're going to get the same bang when you, um, when you, when you develop your own thing. So that, that's certainly been our experience when you develop your own project. Uh, we've saved the, the best for last. Um, I think Lisa and I and our team have been so heartened by hearing stories of students who've already stepped up to opportunities for community service in so many different creative ways, really meeting the needs around them in the communities they were a part of. Now again, because we live in either a shelter-in-place or soon-to-be post-shelter-in-place world, this may take a little more creativity. It may take some needs to either engage with the nonprofit or for parents to help out. Um, what we do see, and I was talking with a student today who felt like their internship was gonna fall through, is what we do see is they can utilize and develop skills that they were hoping to develop in the commercial arena, but potentially do that in a nonprofit or community setting. Um, and so we encourage students and families to really look at what are the communities that you're a part of, what are the issues or concerns that you feel most passionately connected to, and how can you take some of your time to really take initiative and ultimately to show impact here. So um, to wrap up here in terms of how a student should evaluate options, um, I think we've reinforced several times, we want to start with who the student is, what their personal aptitudes, what motivates them. And we frankly don't think it's a sustainable motivation to have the only motivation to be, quote unquote, this will look good on my college application. When the going gets tough, when the student has to do extra work, it only is going to resonate if it's connected to the student's aptitudes and motivators. The second is, particularly for 11th graders, but oftentimes for 10th graders as well, some consideration of major and possible career. Now, I think Lisa mentioned at the beginning, where are their opportunities they want to enhance? Where are they skills that they might want to develop? These are skills that will be important to their engagement in high school, that may be important to them in the colleges they choose to apply to, and maybe included in the stories they tell to the colleges they apply to. And then in any of these five opportunities to make sure that they think about the positive impact both on others, but frankly on themselves. I talked with a family a couple of weeks ago and they said, I really need this summer to be reigniting my students' sense of purpose and hope. And so I think as Lisa said, the, the level of engagement can make such a difference and particularly right now can help many students look ahead to the summer as a period of hope. And so one of the things that parents often ask us is, well, how can I help? And I think genuinely parents are concerned about their kids right now and they also understand the disappointment that many of the kids are facing because most of them, you know, did have, um, a good plan for the summer. So first of all, notice, what is your student actually interested in? And this can be challenging, especially if that interest is really different from yours. And so just watch, like what lights them up? What gets them excited? Where do you notice that they just, oh, they're all in in that. Notice that, show enthusiasm for those things that the student is excited about. The third one I think is so important. All of us as parents want to know because we want to reduce fear around our kids. But the reality is that we have to let our kids 
experiment, evolve. They're not going to know for sure what they want to do. They have to get out there and try some things. And if they feel this incredible pressure, like I've got to, do you love it? Do you love it? Do you love it? That, that can sometimes be a lot of pressure. So let them try things on. They're young. They're going to, they're going to have many different jobs and they can, in all the ways when they experiment, they can develop new skills and it's skills that are going to carry them throughout their college and their career. Help them make connections. They need to learn the skill with your help of asking other people for help asking other people to possibly let them help out at their office or let them volunteer on their project or could I ask you and interview you. Learning to ask for help and make connections is a fundamental skill that these kids are gonna need. They need it in high school, they need it in college, and they need it thereafter. And that's one of the reasons that we have become such proponents of getting kids engaged is they're learning things that take them through their whole life. And this is a great thing for you to mentor your student on and, and help them with. It's really a great opportunity for you as a parent. Help them if they're not comfortable communicating. We definitely have a variance on, you know, even between boys and girls sometimes, but just how comfortable kids are asking for things. It's okay to help them. I always say to kids who are very shy, if you want your parent to come on your informational interview with you, that's fine. I mean, you're, you're young. So give them some leeway, know their strengths and weaknesses and have appropriate expectations. They're probably going to have a summer experience where they liked certain things about it and they didn't like certain things about it. We don't want to get so hung up on a home run, home run that we forget to let them get engaged because we're waiting for the perfect thing. What we want to do is kind of get kids to, you know, I think about students that I work with when they come in the 10th grade and they don't really have much and they haven't been doing much and their parent kind of nudges them to maybe start something and pretty soon it's like learning to ride a bike, the kids taking off with the activity and going. So this is a very um, appropriate place for you to be involved. And I think there's a lot you can do to help your student with activities. You guys have been fantastic. The questions have been great. It's been fun to see um, that many of you are, um, you know, friends of, of College Match Point, and it's great to see you. Bob's gonna tell you a little bit about if you want to get um, more information on our webpage that has the summer opportunities. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, so uh, two quick things. I had shown everybody um, our uh, Facebook page, which is how some of y'all signed up for this. Um, please feel free to follow us on Facebook. We're at uh, Facebook College Match Point. Uh, we update that page several times a day. And then some of you have already chatted us and said, I'm really interested in starting to research this with my student. This is our page that men Lisa mentioned that we're re updating pretty frequently, sometimes daily. In our follow-up note to all of you tomorrow, we'll include an archived version of this video and we'll attach our planning guide to summer planning as well as our worksheet. Many of you have already accessed it. Some of you, we've already been working with your students on it, but we'll share with you with those uh, resources with you. We again, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules. We hope this has given you some guidance in terms of how you as a parent can play a role with helping your students both deal with the disappointment and begin to plan for a summer that includes engagement and excitement for them. Thanks so much and we hope you have a great rest of the evening.